Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is um, quite an honor, and I'm very delighted and excited to introduce you to Dr. Edith Ackerman, and who is a, a visiting scientist both at the School of Architecture at MIT and also the School of Design at Harvard. Well, thank you for inviting me, Mickey. This is a joy because it's also reconnecting after many years of not thinking together and except on co in conferences. So I am very happy Good. to be here. And um, we spoke over lunch about what you are doing. I just looked at the website, you know, the Create website, and I thought about some things to say based on uh, one particular point on your website that has to do with uh, building the models and frameworks and example of constructionist and instruction, uh, instructionist digital learning environments and using these methods uh, to not just assess but also generate mm. uh, learning environments that have important qualities for, for the learners. Now, it's always the same because when we were talking over lunch I said to myself, I should give another talk, but it's too late, so it will be <laughs> next time. The next one will be on uh, designs for learning and <laughs> learning as design, because I realize that this is what you are all about. But what I wanted to do this time uh, was, I am a developmental psychologist, and I have worked a lot with children and trying to understand children's own perspectives on in various domains uh, using the clinical method of investigation as it was uh, sort of crafted, I would like to say, by Piaget and his, his um, team. And when we were working together at the learning and epistemology group, the shifts, it was a shift of focus slightly because instead of studying, let's say, children's, um, the genesis of children's ideas, let's say, in mathematics or in sciences and so on. We were more focused on designing environments for children to actually um, think about a thing. This, this is how Papa got me there. Mm -hmm. He said, Piaget didn't have the time to study children as cybernetician which means the children's own intuitions about uh, control and communication in humans, animals, and machines. And at the time what we had, we had a lab where uh, people were working on the programming language of Logo that Seymour Papert had developed, but it was the time of the wedding between Lego construction kits and Logo programming language so we had a lab where the students could participate in studying uh, the ways in which children and also grown-ups relate to these artifacts, uh, how they think about their work, how they think about their intelligences, and so on. And I came always at it from a more psychological perspective. So I became interested in the genesis of children's ideas about cybernetics. So this just gives you a sense of how this focus shifts progressively from studying children's ways of thinking to actually designing environments for children to learn in. And it's only retrospectively that I realized that we had already done it. But when I was in Geneva as a proletarian in this uh, you know, huge factory of research, that was called the Centre d'Epistemologie. Piaget gave a theme, and we had to design game-like situations that allowed us to interest the child in some theme that was of interest to all these researchers that were the scientists that were sitting there, and to engage in a dialogue with children that hel helps the child get an interesting journey through the phenomenon and us as researchers to get deep insights into children's ways of thinking. So I arrived at the other, uh, on, on the other side of the pond and 
I realized that in my life as a psychologist, I had never even thought about the arts and craft of designing these situations. We were only focused on how you collect and interpret data. And we had never thought about the methods of in uh, inquiry, which was called the, 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 the clinical method of investigation, and the, the art and craft of actually building these experimental settings that were very loose and it was this, um, this type of interview. So this just gives you a background. Now, what I want to talk about, in recent years I have, as a developmental psychologist, you tend to focus on what's common between people, children, at different levels of their development. And while we were work, working with Seymour Papert and all these other people at MIT, we began to be interested in focusing more on styles, individual styles of learning and not stages. So we called it from stages to styles. But we also became more interested in reversing the curse because in psychology, at least when I was young, the notion of being intelligent the notion of cognitive development had to do with a person's capacity to abstract, to extract ideas from context and situation. And it was all focused on the process of abstraction, progressive abstraction from the context. In a way, it was about the disembodiment of the initial sensory motor ways of thinking and how you progressively become able to transcend the contextual constraints, they were called at the time, to think in a more general, decontextualized and abstract way. And the beauty of arriving uh, in a group uh, led by Seymour Papert is that he was very provocative. He said, we are going to put this Piaget on his head. And, we, and at the time, everybody was talking about situated learning, contextual knowledge, the beginning of embodied cognition, beginning of interest to, to work like Lakoff and, and Johnson, whatever one may think about it, of, you know, we, we, we think the way we think because we have the bodies that we have in the environments in which we live. So that was the trend. So we worked a lot on this. Now, what I, I did recently is that I, 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 I said to myself, I want to focus also on one of the differences that I have less focused on in the past, which is the generational differences between youngsters who grew up in a period that I like to qualify as post-Gutenberg, which is the alphabetized uh, person, uh, alphabetisé in French. In, in English, you have this nice word of literacy. Alphabetisé is very narrow if you think of it. And um, uh, so the, what was I saying? The, the difference in generational. And, yeah. sorry, and, and um, the so-called digital natives. And I'm sure we all heard about this at Nauseum. And I, I started this exploration very worried of the uh, dichotomy, the extreme dichotomies that are presented even by people like Prensky, with all my due respect, between the digital natives and the so-called digital immigrants, people like myself, who actually have as a job to raise and teach the youngsters that sometimes do things, they have ways of learning, of being together, that are very unfamiliar. And I, I, I experience this every day at MIT with the students, maybe here also, where, for example, there was much less of a, of a of desire to engage in these passionate, hot times of discussions and arguments. Show and tell became more important. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a certain kind of, um, almost quietness sometimes in the meeting that makes, makes the, 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 the person who is so used to, to these verbal exchanges a little bit uncomfortable and so on. So all this to say that I became interested in whether and 
what kinds of differences one may see in today's children's ways of playing and learning, because I work a lot with the Lego toy companies and I am interested in the relationship between play, imagination, creativity, learning and trust. It's, it's huge, but he, 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 these, are, these are the kinds of mm, articulations that I am interested in. So I started looking at uh, questions like, how do today's children think about themselves? Uh, how do they relate to other people? And how, in a way, do they uh, play and learn differently? But also, what expectations do they have from each other and from the kinds of tools that they have at their avails? Because when the tools change, uh, the, 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 the expectation change. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I feel like doing here is just rushing you almost through the, the, the parameters that I have identified to talk about these differences, but then to try to focus also maybe for the discussion on new forms of literacy, on what I call a culture of simulation, which has to do with different ways of thinking about dynamic modeling or representations of the world, and especially uh, new forms of uh, hands-on activities, new, new rapport to things and new ways of producing things, mm -hmm. of making. Because we have heard about hands-on culture since a long time and it's nice to, to sort of refine these categories. So, um, here was my... Oh, what I want to say be just as a prelude, I, I, I never finish normally. The preludes, it's, it's you can, what, after you can do an hour. whatever you want yeah. for two hours. So, okay, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> so, it doesn't matter. These yeah. are just like two uh, terms that we have heard a lot in the research that was uh, founded by the MacArthur Foundation. This notion of new media ecology is important because what it captures is that. Uh, People live and learn in environments that are hybrid, that are uh, where, where you find traditional tools and mediations and intersects and are augmented, intersect and are augmented by, and in some cases they, they, they mirror or they invert their digital counterparts. So from book to Facebook, from online video games to GarageBand, uh, Kinet, from curriculum based educational software, the whole gamut. Uh, by genres of enga uh, engagement, um, I, re I, I refer to the ways in which learners and their teachers, care caregiver, navigate, sort of stake also, inhabit and furbish these hybrid media environments. The way they move between uh, adoption, appropriation, and creative uses of what's at their avail. And there are two almost humoristic assumptions that I like to make. The first one is that no one ever lives in one real mode or channel alone. And the last people usually to discover this are people who do research on uses of technology. And this is the lack of humility by psychologists and technological researchers who think that the child doesn't do anything else at other times than the type of specific technology that the person is interested in studying the effects of on the child. And the, ho the whole methodology of, of sort of sometimes of pre-posts is ironically based on this notion that, you know, I am going to have an intervention with the child on, the, on, on, on such and such uses of technology. And then we compare the group and the ex uh, their experimental group and the control group, and we will draw some conclusion on their appropriation of this particular technology. And it is such an irony that the common sense notion that we all, even when we play games, we always do it in physical context. We like to have certain friends around ourselves. We interrupt our activities by other things. 
that usually the researcher doesn't see because it doesn't look in, 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 in the context over long periods of time, which is very difficult, and so on. So my first assumption is this. No one ever lives in one real mode channel. Uh, instead, we move between words, physical, virtual, and digital. And this is almost like relax. We have to relax because there is no panic. There is no more panic when kids play uh, on, on video than when they read a book. And usually, that this was Seymour Papert, our mentor, used to say that. The people who are most frenetic when you say, well, they don't use their body because they play, which is all true, but they wouldn't do the same criticism if a child would read a book. Mm. So it's, it's, it's sort of these kinds of consideration. The other one is that rarely anyone does one thing for one single reason. And I'm not talking about doing one thing at a time. This multitasking notion, I think, is a little overplayed. But we don't ever rarely do one thing for a single reason. Like in the, in the Mark Arthur uh, research, they talk about friendship-driven and interest-driven engagements. And I would like us to think that they are very related. Mm -hmm. And that is an, it's a difficult category. And also, we don't do one thing for one reason, but we don't stay at the, several, at the same level of engagement over time. So I like the distinction between hanging out, messing around, and geeking out by Ito and the whole group, because it shows these different levels where you, where you satisfy yourself to be a lurker at some point, and then you start messing around eventually, you get closer, and then you eventually geek out for something very specific. But even my friends at the Exploratorium who studied the ways in which the visitors at the museum engage some of the amazing sort of interactive, not in the technological sense, but exhibits that they propose, and they are, they are just remarkable, they tend to focus on the moments when people are hands-on engaged. And we usually don't have the time to follow people and to also, uh, let's say, honor the moments when somebody is in the lurker phase, when somebody is in the phase where they just want to take a moment to contemplate, where they maybe revisit or reenact something. We tend, at least, the I say we the constructivists, Maybe it's not your illness here. But we, the constructivists, like to focus on the moments when there is this, you know, this messing around uh, going on. And, and we like to study how we progressively geek out, which is wonderful. Um, but there are all these moments, I think, in the process of self-directed learning that are equally important. And I, I, I like to think of them as connect, Construct is all the seas. Contemplate, which is another word for reflection. Cast, which is a word for theater and reenacting things. And collaborate, or rather convivia, convivere. It's illich. It's to be together with other people, learning from their perspective the difference, negotiating differences, and then continue the cycle. So I think it is useful to think of um, the cycle of, of self-directed learning by taking a little bit of the focus away of only this sort of very active period. Because I believe that the, especially the, the, the replay, you know, we at the time uh, in, in, in the group at the Epistemology and Learning Group, we used to talk about hands-on, heads-in, and talk back, play back. But one can try to refine this model, and I like to, to try these kinds of things. So um, my outline was, <laughs> my outline was is, is um, uh, to look at um, the digital natives, I can send you this, uh, yes. if you like, yeah. because I have also text written 
with it so it can be like a little booklet and then if we are interested in we can pursue some of these conversations if, if it resonates with what we are doing. So these digital natives, who are they, what's to be learned? Uh, what's being proposed by uh, educational institutions? So I call it 21st century skills, but it's not just that. I like to focus on 20th century uh, media literacy skills, the work of Henry Jenkins and all these people, but also gaming, learning through gaming, uh, Katie Selim and all these people, and and maybe uh, about literacy, they are, there is many interesting work also about that you probably worked a lot about types of product production uh, ways of making. I wanted to talk about programming. Whether one thinks that in today's school children should learn to program or not to program. I don't, I don't know if we ever get there today, but uh, I looked at it more from a psychological point of view because I gave a talk together with Mitch Resnick who launched Scratch, the programming language, which is like a continuation of, lo of Logo. And we were both asked to talk in Paris about the importance of programming and we had different views and it would be nice at some point to have this conversation. And um, so let me just get you, I hope I don't, I, I told Ricky, she already heard part of this which makes me not feel so good. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just it's the a beginning. New, it's a, it's a, re, a reviewing. It's a review. So yeah, it's, it's a revisitation. revisitation so. so Basically, um, what I did, I, I, I looked very closely at this, not just MacArthur Foundation studies, but also research that we did elsewhere, and I came up with a uh, sixth dimension that I like, actually. They, are, they, I, they feel solid, and they are very interconnected. They form a system, and I'm just going to run you through uh, this dimension where I think they are differences that one can observe and taken together they make for a, a slightly different picture in looking about the ways of um, engaging of today's youth compared to for example when I grew up. The first, the first one uh, has to do with the notion of a, a, a more fluid identity, a fluid self and plural identity. Uh, so here the idea is that more than in previous generation, today's kids grow up in a culture and we live in a culture, uh, we exist and evolve in multiple realms, as I said before, so the sense of self is at once more fluid and more distributed. I have an example, I say in their play, the children take on different personas or role, which they then incorporate as hosts of voices within, which is nothing new, because Bakhtin talked about it, uh, Vygotsky talked about it. Um, but what is different is that in digital media, you can wear several hats at once. Mm -hmm. And you can simultaneously explore different aspects of self in varying contexts that are often shielded from one another. And in each, you will be taken at face value. This is a huge difference. It's bizarre. So this notion that you can explore at the same time and over time these different aspects of yourself, you can, you can present yourself as a five-headed dragon, you know, in, 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 or, or a man if you are a woman, or all these things, and this is bizarre. So for each of these trends, I, I also put a challenge, and this is important, because fluid selves are really great, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and multiple identities is, is also great, but the challenge for today's children is to invent new ways of striking a balance between spreading themselves thin and remaining true to who they are, keeping their identity, whatever that means. And that's a difficult one, but 
there you have it. The second one has to do with new ways, you, you, you mentioned before, more than in previous generation, today's youngsters seem to proceed outside in instead of inside out. This is a Vygotskian term, it's semi-useful. But what it means is that they usually, and I sit with my students, they don't first think and then act, or first try out things for themselves and then share them with others. Instead, what they do is that, I call it, they mingle before they make and they share before they think. Yeah. And the, the youngsters are known for disseminating half-baked ideas and creations either found or self-made, which they then bounce around, often at very fast pace, instead of keeping them for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and they often do so with kindred spirits, present or absent, even before they seek help from knowledgeable adults. So that puts a little bit in question Vygotsky's notion of caring and knowledgeable adults. They are still important. But the kids seek these uh, communities of trust in which they actually can come up with a little crappy first draft because they know, and this is where all these points of my little system uh, will connect, because they know that the tools they have nowadays allow them to iterate. They know that they can keep track of something and uh, work on, you know, in a layered fashion on top of it. Uh, so that changes. When I was a, a student, I wrote my doctoral thesis with a typewriter. So you can imagine the problem when I had to change a paragraph from one place to the other in the document. You didn't. You didn't. You just <laughs> didn't. You thought it all through, and then you did these drafts. You put them everywhere in your apartment, basically, before you start typing, because it's too painful, so you just don't do it. So this has huge implication in how people author and produce actually uh, text, but also other things these days. Um, the third one is very important to me because it has to do with, it's sort of the spatial equivalent of distributed and liquid cells. So it's like new ways of transiting and settling. It's a uh, new, uh, it's like new ways of moving between these worlds and to go places often without moving their bodies. Uh, and in working with Lego, what I became interested in is that some children feel at home in more than one place or no place in particular, and many seek their grounds in virtual places uh, when they, they are transported from one place to the other, either through commuting or going from house of dad to house of mom. So they want to carry something invariant with them, which are these words that, these, you know, digital words. But other kids also like to carry around the stuff they care about. So I have students who did beautiful work on uh, the, the, the role of backpacks in, in today's children, but also the way, the way people start investing a space that they know is ephemeral and they cannot leave trace in them. So even the way people occupy a hotel room, for example, it changes a lot because some people are like the nomads. They have to stay their territory a little bit. They put like their little carpet there. You know, what, however symbolic and otherwise don't care, others don't care. They just need their plugins to their familiar devices that they can then bring bring with them. And the clever kids uh, from recomposed or split family, they ask each parent to buy a preferred toy or device so that it awa awaits them whenever and wherever they will have to stay uh, <coughs> overnight or so. So there are very different strategies to deal with a sort of either self-imposed or culture-imposed mobility that obliges people to find creative solutions, and, and, and they do. So here, the, the challenge is that this, uh, this urge to cross the borders, geographical and cultural, 
I call it take a walk on the wild side and see what's at the other side, puts an end to the notions of home, territory, and roots as we know them. The, the, the youngsters often exhibit a somehow disembodied yet deeply felt sense of belonging to a global world that is populated with kindred spirits. And the challenge, because there is always a challenge as a generation, is to find new ways of reconciling this desire of evasion or of, of, yeah, of evasion in, in virtual world and the need to be grounded and securely attached. Literally in the sense of attachment theory, to rethink it. Because I think the biggest problem in, in, in these nomadic cultures is very deep troubles in secure attachment, um, not just to territory, but to people. And this whole, uh, I would like in a way to, to be able to think with people that um, have a different perspective on this growing interest about autism in this culture and so on, to not look at it as autism like only autism, but to think about some of the implications of not being securely attached because the changes are just too fast, because nomadic culture have invented for themselves the fantastic ways not to be uh, unsecurely attached. So for example, they go in routines, they always come back to the same places. They have ways of staking the territory, which the kids have to learn so fast that it's very difficult. Uh, and here come the, the, the more uh, pointed uh, differences that I think you work more on and that I wanted to focus on has to do with new forms of literacy or literacy beyond print. I call it new ways of saying it, uh, new genres of authoring. And uh, there seems to be very deep shifts in what it means to be literate and a literate thinker. I call it from right to sprite, as in speak right. And we had already students working on this when we were together at the, at, at, in the epistemology and group. But also from notate to annotate and um, uh, a closing gap. And this is the bizarrest thing for me, and I wonder how you think about it. Closing gap between the act of reading and the act of writing. So I try to explain myself. It takes a year to write a book, it takes a week to read it. Okay, so there is, there is disconnect there. What we see more and more is people who read, read that, that write, writing becomes often, and these are people like Ong Olson and Langshear. They are fantastic uh, references to look at. Often writing becomes this quick and dirty assembly of cut and paste fragments, a blending of text, image, and sounds, while reading turns into a meticulous act of highlighting, earmarking, and extracting bits for later use. So annotating and editing are sort of overriding the act of notation. And this is a very strange phenomenon. I don't, I don't know how you see it. But they meet in this quick way of uh, writing as assembly and this slower way of reading, because you always, as soon as you read something, you think of addressees, you think of who inspires you, you act like the digital natives that like to immediately pass on half-baked ideas, and then it comes around and you can together reiterate. So, texting, on the other hand, is about right to speak. So that we, kn we know it's more familiar. And since texting is slow, the children invent ways to speed it up. So they mutilate spelling as we have been used to, you know, to, to practice it. And what, what again is very strong is that today's author rarely start from scratch. I like that idea a lot. They borrow from who inspires them and they address to those whose opinion matters. It has always been that way, but it was a taboo to talk about it. So in, in, the, in the sort of post-Gutenbergian type of uh, alphabetization, you know, literacy, literature, they mix the two words, 
uh, it's all, first of all, it's not lowbrow, it's highbrow, you know. So you have conventions actually to recognize the work that you borrow on, which is very important, it's the quotation. Uh, nowadays, the children are confused because it's so easy to borrow that they sometimes don't recognize their sources, which is a problem. And the biggest problem among educators today is to come to grips. They, they sort of reconfigure, repurpose, remix incomes to actually leave their marks on it so that it takes on their signature. This is a topic that I could speak for hours about because I think that it's a big problem for educators today to come to grips with what they view as plagiarism. And it's a serious question students' tendency to pick up and pass on ready-made imports that have not been massaged long enough or mindfully engaged, and it's huge. On the other hand, I think that a huge work can be done in giving conditions and designing situations where the child who receives these bits and reconfigures them very quickly to pass it along actually are given the opportunity of not being seen only as information brokers. They take this information that comes in Iraq, but especially be given the time to massage and remassage and revisit and rechange these inputs until they are almost like a vernish, you know, until they are molded to actually become your own. So I am dreaming of situations like, uh, I think they do exercises like this in cinema, where different students would receive, let's say, a scenario, and every student does uh, a sort of filmic version of it. I, I dream of a situation where everybody starts from the same text. So a, a text, and then you are just offered to rewrite this text as you go layering, almost like on Wikipedia, where you just, when it resonates with something that is very yours, you transform it to transform it, and you go through this even alone, not in group, alone, it's important, for a long time, and then you show the text of different people, and they would be totally different texts. So that's another way of thinking about authorship, but the conditions for it to become yours are very precise and they have to be respected. And they can never be respected in education because it takes time. And that's, mm. that's the biggest problem, it takes time. So it's a different way of taking the time to authoring and writing than what we learned when we were young, but it still takes time to massage something long enough until it becomes yours. So. That's a huge one. And, and again, the challenge is, the challenge is um, to help educators this time, to help students honor what they borrow, to gain an appreciation for the fact that a multi-log uh, textual production, can, it can be interesting to, to, to follow the thread of who says what, and not just blur at the moment where finally, I remember at the time we said at the moment where finally the, the women and everybody had their voice. They were all these smart terriers who were explaining to everybody that the text doesn't have to be authored, the death of the author and the whole blah, 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 which was a big excuse no longer to recognize the sources. So this is a huge problem, but I think it can be addressed in interesting ways. Then we have, um, this is important. Um, I think we are moving from a culture of notation or description to a culture of simulate, simuling. Simuling, not simulating. Because simulating has this notion that you are mimicking something that exists in the real world. So for example, a, a professional flight simulator. I'm thinking simuling more in the sense of creating a a micro world in the sense of Seymour Papert, namely an, an interactive environment in which you can dwell and discover things, but that precisely have different qualities than the ones that you can explore directly in the real world. So um, 
Yes. So today's kids expect the tools they use to provide immediate feedback and more important to let them undo previous moves to recover mm -hmm. uh, and keep track of what they are doing to revisit. There we are again. And I call it the, this good enough mother quality of digital tools that are attentive, responsive and for, for, forgiving does breed a culture of iteration. It gives the courage to try again, build on top of playful exploration, go for it, no move is fatal, uh, in ways that pre-digital tools hardly could. It also has, it's a trade-off, because these tools are very good if you just layer on top of one another, but if you have a divergence at some point, even on Wikipedia, they send you somewhere else to negotiate your differences and then you come back. You go in the little room where people are punished for having different views, right? <laughs> and, that, and, and, and then you layer again. So this is also a problem. Um, and Baudrillard has written a lot about these things, but I'm going to pass on it. And, and, and this one is the one that I have been working mostly on is with people at the Exploratorium Science Museum, but also with designers and so on, is this rethinking this notion of hands-on activities. Because, you know, you find a hundred versions of it from the teacher who just instructs to say, now try this, but it's a little demo that is totally uh, sort of pre-anticipated. It's almost like canned, canned little moment of exploration versus actually a more design, uh, designerly approach. Um, and I call it a culture of bricoleurs. I go back to Lévi-Strauss and all these people because it's the makers, hackers, hobbyists, uh, new rapport to, thing, to things, and I call it from do-it-yourself culture to do it together to being in it together. And these are different. Um, the bricoler is a jack of all trades who knows to make do. I love this term. It's deserto. To make do with what's at hand. You don't start from scratch. It's, it's always the same ideas that I develop, but from this different perspective. You don't start from scratch. Um, and the, the, the bricoler is very different from the engineer uh, because the bricoler is sort of adept at many tasks and putting pre-existing things together in new ways and the engineering contract is a little bit more of a planner, a programmer. So these differences are interesting to, 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 to try to elaborate on because there is a lot of talk about hands-on but it's no longer quite enough. Um, more than in previous generation, I think, to Kate, this is me being optimistic now, um, are eager to gather, collect, create, and trade stuff, preferably tangible, but not necessarily. And like today's authors, the bricolers like to tweak the things they find, to give them a second life for extra powers, the children, for example, with toys to animate them, and so, and that's where programming can come in. And as they grow older and perfect the, their technical skills, these professional amateurs, as uh, uh, James G. calls them, the proams, they invent many new and clever ways of making things, crafting and fabricating, of making things do things, of controlling and programming things, and repurposing things. And I think it's mostly, and this is paradoxical, it's mostly their confidence in and knowledge about how to fix and mend things. We called it debugging at the time because we were so in the world of uh, cognitive science and, and programming. I like to call it fixing and mending things together with the beliefs in the benefits of iteration, layering and refining that holds the potential to breed a new culture of crafting. That's the way I see the connection. And I say that if given a, ch a chance and provided appropriate support, today's kids won't merely consume and dispose, they will create and recycle, they will mm. care. And this uh, sort of, this to me was an epiphany because it changed the way I started studying at these cultures of maker. That's when I started going to the makers cultures, uh, when I started realizing that the makers cultures are fantastic, but it's still very of a certain kind. 
there are different ways probably of, of doing it, but what is interesting to see is also they create almost their own conditions of production. You know, they, there is a, a, a culture of gifting often. Uh, they, 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 they find out ways to uh, finance their projects only for the life cycle of the project. It has huge implications that I like to think about, and especially a culture of recycling. Now, I think I will not talk much, much longer because I would like to have a discussion. So uh, the, 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 the programming part, we will just let, let go. Um, so not every, uh, not all these sort of neo-millennial traits that I have described are present in every child and, you know, and, and they shouldn't be exacerbated the way certain people do, but they are significant enough to, to pay close attention to. And um, the, the, the lessons um, that I learned, and I continue to work on this, is that each of the dominant traits that I just exposed breeds tension that call for readjustment. That's simulation. Yeah. <laughs> Many of which are already emerging for those who know how to look. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the natives are slowly reclaiming their bodies. They invent new territories to go about their business. And they develop their own ethos on things worth pursuing and why. It's huge. Um, <coughs> now, the question remains is, what does it take um, to develop the expertises that allow them to be in control of the technology rather than being controlled by it and, and so forth and so on. So my last slide will be, and, and then we can always jump, jump. My, my last slide will just be on some of the compensatory, uh, this is really assimilation and accommodation, but it's, it's like, and this is, already a little bit closer to giving um, guidelines for designers of environments. Mm -hmm. um, the notion of plural identity and fluid, fluid self screens for new ways of thinking about what it means to be centered. Um, the, 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 the culture of shareism, it's very nice to be in it together to develop empathy, but it's also important to remain personally accountable. Mm -hmm. It's a very difficult balance. Uh, the border crossing and mobility, this one, I, because I am always interested in space, is easier for me to understand. There is a cost to being a nomad. Mm -hmm. There is a cost of being a nomad that um, uh, what's her name? Um, I, I blank out her name. The beautiful book of strangers to ourselves. Um, it's, it's a book called Strangers to Ourselves, which talks about the kinds of things that you need to let go if you move from place to place. You need to lose your memory. Uh, you need you need to to completely eliminate parts of you know your your experience. Uh, you, you, you become stranger in a way to yourself in a way. I, the name will come back to me because it, the introduction of this book is just great. Uh, she's the wife of Soler and she's Romanian. Christina? Yes, Julia Christina. Oh, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. This one is, yes, how to be grounded, rooted, and anchored. And I think it's worthwhile studying different groups and people who are unrooted in certain ways and try to look very carefully be, 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 before even giving advice to them. Just look at how clever they are to find their groundings, you know, mm -hmm. but also how, how can you support that um, uh, if you are an educator? This one, uh, I like this notion of Malaguzzi from the um, yeah, from the Reggio Emilia schools, that Brunner actually endorsed right. a great deal about the 100 languages of children. So at the time when they wrote this book, there was not yet many uh, digital technologies, 
But the underlying theory is a very nice framework to think about how in today's world, the children also, when they are little, like to speak in a hundred languages, make hybrids between images, text, and, and, and I mean, for heaven's sake, they're role models just doing PowerPoints like this, so I shouldn't <laughs> really do it. But at the same time here, the trade-off is that once you have done this for a while, it's lovely also to remain um, loyal to the types of constraints that given media require and not just to jump. So for example, if Wim Wenders is such a great filmmaker, is that he pushed in the world of uh, visual images and, and if, uh, if, if um, what's his name? <coughs> If somebody teaches poetry to children, it's, it's nice to jump between situations where you let them jump between the media and respect sort of almost like the integrity of, of a certain medium. So that's a hard balance also. This one is very important and I didn't speak enough about, I spoke about the culture of gaming, I didn't speak enough about the culture of singing as in offering dynamic modeling tools to children that allow them to understand dynamic patterns behind things like in mathematics or so, or in geometry or in other domain in systems theories, to have dynamic <coughs> modeling tools that allow them to capture better than with a static descriptive um, model a representation, the, the, the phenomena and what are the traits of there. Uh, I worked a lot with Turk, with Ricardo Nemirovsky on ways to get children initiated to graph, to graphs. Because sometimes the graphs are built to facilitate their understanding, let's say, of the relationship between distance, speed, and, 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 uh, and time. But the graph complicates matters because you have to translate your intuitions of your own body moving in space to the graph. So there are techniques to actually have them produce graphs through their movements that are nice examples. And this one, there is a lot of work to be done. And uh, the, the, the talk I gave with, uh, with Mitchell Resnick, so maybe uh, I just send you the papers, but it's all about, it's all about the, the fact that I think one has to receive this notion of programming. I think it would be, absurd to ask children to just learn to program in the way that we even uh, advocated it in the 80s because the act of programming and the ways in which now people can even control uh, elements like in their authoring tools and so on emerge in certain ways. So one aspect of programming has to do with giving instructions to something, you know, uh, which is sort of the classic definition. Another one has to do with actually uh, amusing oneself with the autonomy that the thing that you program takes. So this is more like this overnight programming with emergent effects where you don't enjoy programming things because you can anticipate what they will do and you plan and so on, but you, you let yourself surprise. There are other notions of programming that Mike Eisenberg and his group developed, which are wonderful, mm -hmm. where the instructions don't appear in a computer completely separated from the context in which you live, because it's ugly. And this is the only word I have to say. No judgment, it's ugly. <laughs> so if you are interested in bringing elements of uh, choreographing, let's say, your space and the movement of artifacts in a space, you need to think differently. And there are gorgeous examples by Ma uh, Mike Eisenberg where they, it's, it's not like in Mindstorms where you program this creature, you know, like in a planning way, but it's just a reader of barcodes and you put the barcodes in the environment. And so you can, it's a, it's a performative act. You can program almost this, uh, this vehicle by just putting on these stickers and at the beginning they had these barcodes, uh, they were printed but then you can just draw them, you know, 
And progressive, you and the examples also of Lea Bouchelet, these beautiful examples of building circuitry with, with conductive paints, um, circuit, circuitry with um, threads that allow all of the sudden to bring to life textiles, uh, uh, the, the whole paper computing idea and so on. It's very nice. And, uh, and what I notice in these cultures, and this is in talking with my students who work with Lea Bouchelet, who is a student of Mike Eisenberg, is that the programming is no longer the most important. They use um, a programming language to, to build, let's say, their Arduino board or their lily pads, but they have this constructopedia where if they need an operation for, uh, if they need um, an algo a little algorithm to, to get something, do something, uh, they borrow it. Like we find some children who said, you are a hacker, can you write the code for me on this? That you are doing, that would be great. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> So um, the floor is open, and please don't be shy, and, and also it would be a great time to ask questions that anything that really res resonated yeah. with you, just sort of try to evoke something that will help you think through a problem. So um, on this last note about programming, I know you didn't want to get into programming so much, but um, I've, been, I've been looking at programming a little bit, and... Introduce um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and and so the issue with programming that I've been seeing is, well, on the one hand, um, it's true. Just the code, like code on a, on a page or on a screen, doesn't mean much, and you can call it ugly. Or um, I don't know if that's that's the, the sense that you get with ugly. That it doesn't really mean much, and so so it's it's important to experience it on whatever level um, that, that has meaning. Yeah. But, but the problem that I've been seeing is that, so, so even with logos, so I've been in this classroom where they use a kind of variant, or before they were using kind of variant of logo, pretty logo. Yeah. But, but one of the problems is still this kind of planning, being able to plan a program. And so while they can experience a program from action to action, but, um, but this, and I think you've, you've written about this also, about this being able to be in the experience, but stepping out. Yeah. So there's the perspective inside, yeah. and then there's perspective from the outside, and, and being able to go back and forth, and so that's also the cycle that you're talking about, like yes. the reflection, as well as the enactment, um, and, the, and the various stages of, of you know, not only being immersed, and yeah. understanding from the inside of that experience, so if it's um, programming a robot, and the, the kids that I've seen, they can think in terms of one action to the next, yeah. but they have a very hard time planning the program. Yeah. And so then this, this always becomes the question. So even like, these wonderful things you described, Mike Eisenberg is involved in. Yeah. This is where I wonder about that aspect that, that's been so hard for the girls that I've been watching the program, that, that you know, they, they have a hard time stepping out and being able to, at that level, it is does become a kind of, you know, hopefully what, this teacher has been wanting them to do is, is be able to extract from the experience in. And so then that's also this, like, the Lake Up and Johnson kind of theory about starting with yeah. rounding up an experience and then being able to extract the patterns. Yes. But, but that's, it still seems very difficult to, yeah. to, 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 to be able to bridge this and, and to encourage this, you know, the, the, these different spaces and experiences and understandings that happen. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, the way I see the problem, and I don't have a solution for it, is that when we think of moving back and forth between moments of reflection and action, or now I do step-by-step -step control of a device I program versus now I write a procedure because I am liking this game of guessing, planning a little bit, guessing what it's gonna, gonna do and then come back in. The problem is that I think we are a little bit too influenced by the 
types of ways, the practices in which educators do that within more school context. And maybe one way of thinking about this is to compare this particular rituals of moving between reflection and action, also taking different perspectives, um, to thinking about ways in which other creative cultures do that, that are not schools. And what I notice when I work with designers at the GSD, for example, it's not that they don't do that, but they have a very strong sense of ugliness when you have certain kinds of discontinuities between the control and command center that you need all of a sudden to go there be behind the stage in order to actually program something that happens on a stage on which you are. And it's a huge question and I totally am with you when we have to think about situations in which you can move not just between these two levels but taking on the different perspectives but I also believe that uh, the ways that the rhetoric around even the ways to do that is limitative and I just want to quote Seymour Papert I brought a quote of him that I like very much he doesn't give an answer but he acknowledges that there is a problem. It's in the second edition of Mindstorms, in the, in, the, in, in, in the introduction he writes, Mindstorms unquestionably has a bug for giving prominence to structured programming as a model for thinking about thinking. I could say in mitigation that I occasionally point out that this is just one model and even propose to, propose to use it to define less mechanical ways of thinking by, contract, by contrast. Nevertheless, I can understand why the book seems to have had, for some readers, a net effect of strengthening the tendency to see structured analytical thinking as synonymous with good thinking that is inherent in computer science, in educational theory, and indeed in the canonical traditional epistemology itself. Do you imagine the, the confession? Mm -hmm. A reason for this might be that although Mindstorms empathically proposes the idea of bricolage as a model for general scientific theorizing, the idea comes late in the book and is not developed as an alternative style of programming. I was more explicit about this in later writing, including especially my collaborative work with Sherry Turco. Thus, teachers who approached the book for advice on how to use logo and dropped it when they encountered the above-mentioned rough spots would not be faulted for going away with the idea of teaching their students to use only structured programming. So our task is, what would unstructured programming that looks l less like the sort of AI version of it and the rhetoric around it, what would it look like without falling in the trap of letting go of such important notions as actually writing procedures or encapsulate step-by-step -step ideas in a, in a in the digital world, it's sort of about glass boxing and black boxing, mm -hmm. you know. At some point, it's very nice to, to follow things step by step, but then you would like to encapsulate it and take this as an entity that you can work on. So this is a very nice idea in programming. I think another one is conditionals. Mm -hmm. but, but there are other ways of doing it. There has to be other ways of doing it. And... Um, I notice also that many of the programs that people uh, write um, when they work in the ateliers of Lea Bouchelet for the moment are not sophisticated programming. But when the students 
have this sensibility and they go back to Mitresnik's group. They do no longer work in Scratch. They, they don't work in Scratch the same way anymore. They become to find it distasteful that you have to be in the world of a certain kind of offering, which is in this case this iconic way of programming. You are in this box of this of this scratch thing, even if the children can compare their projects and all these nice things that Alan Kay actually was adding at the time. Um, some students who have developed this designerly sensibility, they come up with these amazing projects. And one is Jay Silver. He's a complete nut, but he does these beautiful projects where, for example, you can, and this is the Mike Eisenberg sensibility, where, for example, uh, you can just translate on a, on a small um, uh, uh, I, iPod. When, when the child enters uh, certain colors, um, you know, you, 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 you can tap in some colors, it recognizes you do the colors, they actually transform into sounds. So you can do things like just do a gesture, change colors, and it, it, it records so you can sing. You can sing. Au clair de la lune, mon ami Pierrot. And then when you, when you actually um, go back to it, it sings that. But if you, for example, do do, re, mi, fa, sol, you create a musical instrument. But it uses gesture, it uses, you know, these kinds of um, very different input and output devices. So you're saying that at the level of being able to, to see a pattern, then, then that's where, then that's, that's this different level of programming. Yes, assignment. yeah. So because you can I think that the material, thinking in a more designerly way about the types of input output devices, uh, pay careful attention to certain rules of discontinuity and continuity between context and, and controlling the context is huge. It's, it's huge. I, I don't have solutions. I, I just notice that when I work with different people who come from these different cultures, even the MIT geeks in a class uh, at, at the GSD where they have more designerly sensibility, they just come up with projects that feel so differently. And those different fields of the project, even if it does the same in term, conceptually in terms of programming, it will attract people that normally are not attracted by programming. So it's very important, I think, to, to think about these questions. It's, uh, I am just starting with all this, but um, in looking at different types of maker cultures, you really begin to see that they have very, they emerge, like they have different ethos, really. They have different um, value systems that drive their engagements and, and ways of working together. Um, and I think that it is a long time that in education people are aware that values and knowledge need to be brought together more. But when I think about just the different ways in which we called the, if you are old enough like myself, you went through, I look at you, because you are a bit older than these people. It's like, it was called um, information society. And then it was called knowledge society. And then it was called creative society. And then it was called experiential society. And now it's all about well-being, the role of the body. Probably the more our cultures go down the drain, the more we talk about, about the importance of 
the body as a first environment that we need to take care of. So well-being becomes important, emotional mm -hmm. balance and not just cognitive. And last but not least, questions of ethics. It's going to become huge. I'm, I, I don't know how they're going to call it, the next trend, but it's going to be about ethos. And it's not new, but what I find interesting is how differently they are weighed these things. And when, when you talk with these different maker cultures, they are very strong about this. So f there is a very interesting um, new ethos about um, c cultures of gifting, new ethos about how you finance projects, new ways of thinking about trading, not just of ideas, but of things. And, and I think I, I, I like very much a, a saying of one of the colleagues who organizes the Maker Fair in uh, San Francisco, D D Dale Dugarty from O'Reilly. He is so refreshing because what he says is that in education, what we need to do is to know how to scout the talents where they are. And we have learned not to even see those talents, where they are and where they emerge. And um, it's something worth, worth pursuing, and also worth pursuing the different ethos that is behind different groups. Because, for example, there are the slam poetry movements, there are all these, including the Occupy, I'm sorry to say, in some respect. Just the creative way in which they go about it. Mm -hmm. Just that. Um, for example, when here in the Occupy movement they didn't have electricity at some point, the geeks at MIT spent two nights to create bicycles uh, that would generate electricity for the computers of the people who wrote about the movement. It has nothing to do with the political orientation. It's like, what? You know, and then they, they drove all these machines down and people showed solidarity to whatever, it doesn't matter, by starting to pedal for the others. So it's again, it's this notion of using your own energy to... Another one was when it became cold, you had the knitters. Uh, the knitters who came down and knitted on the spot, it's like an art performance knitted on the spot all these gloves and nice little shawls for everybody. <laughs> it's like, you wouldn't see that in a political movement in the 80s in, in Europe or in the States, you know. So it's to pay attention to all these. There are all these movements, even in the Montessori school now, it's about bringing the, the urban and the, the rural back together in different ways. So they have these parklet projects. They have the, the flower guerrilla projects. They have the projects where the kids do experiments with food, uh, because it's very important not just to be fed better and to move, but also to know the production cycle of, of, of things, and so, so that, yeah, I'm blabbering, sorry. Might give rise to a view that we have just caught me on So, so uh, I, I enjoy very much this, this sort of distinction between the idea of, of reflection and activism or engagement, and also um, your statements about um, um, the concept of like one creating uh, the conditions of their own production. Yeah. Production. So recently I've seen some articles around um, around the topics of, of group work, um, yeah. people working together uh, in the workplace, etc. And, and there's been some questions raised as to whether um, uh, the groups are actually as productive in creating, in being creative. Yeah. So I was wondering if you had any thought about, about those, these new processes that are in our workplace that involve collaboration and whether they do provide people with those kinds of engagements and activisms that may give rise to, to creativity and whether the design of those locations have any uh, impact on, on this work. That's a huge question. I mean, that's a big yeah, it's a huge question. It's, um, the only way for me to go about it is to follow a little bit the way in which uh, James Paul G is thinking. 
or John C. D. Brown when he talk when they talk about the differences in which groups form and dissolve the systems of loyalties around what kinds of issues and for how long are companions in a crazy project, whatever it is, how long are they following each other and being loyal to each other, and at what moment does everyone think, oh, this is no longer my, my cup of tea, I, I bifurcate. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if there exist good models to make these differences, but this is a way to get at these questions. Because, um, and, and, and some of the work, even on situated learning, by I, I'm thinking about Wenger's this time, and, um, and Leif, because when they talk about peri peripheral participation to a, a community of practice, it's only as if they looked at one movement. It's like how the apprentice in the garage in, mm -hmm. you know, in near Rome starts watching the, the, the master uh, car repairer and progressively gets pulled in. My sense is that these uh, flexible communities now, they are much more individualistic, actually, in an mm -hmm. interesting way. Mm -hmm. People have the bizarrest like, interests when they geek in, mm -hmm. and they have very special types of loyalties that is un ununderstandable, at least mm -hmm. for me. And the, 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 the commitments, the sets of commitments have different life, uh, life span. And, um, and there are studies, but I don't know enough about it. About You see, if some people always remain lurkers, it is a problem. So I don't know how to capture over time these engagements, disengagements, and these loyalties. I can only call them loyalties. Also mm. commitment. Yeah, commit you know, uh, commitment. Uh, because that's a problem in, in some of these cultures is that they have not figured out yet for themselves rules of commitment and loyalties that are actually evolutionary stable strategies for themselves. The changes happen so fast that people don't have the time to invent the, the always the adequate answers. And the same is even true of the kinds of commitments that you have, the, the last book of Sherry Turkle, basically, mm -hmm. together alone. Mm -hmm. Or she becomes older and she regrets that she was yeah. so enthusiastic for all these uh, ways of making friends online. So it's like, it's, it's amusing because it's her becoming older and say, oh my God. <laughs> they go to the cafe and they just look at each other. Uh, they mm -hmm. don't look at it, they just, uh, and well, so forth and so on. So you look out at other people, but you also look at yourself and you spend a lifetime in all these little communities and then that core community that you might have had 30 or 40 years ago when one was younger, yeah. you know, people don't have those same kind of commitment, the same friends no. that you've had. For, and mm. you might have a friend living in this country and a friend living yeah. in that country and a friend living, but there isn't that sort no. of like, you know, Friday night or Saturday night no. where you all get together no. and you, like, well, there's, that, that's, I think, sort of what, huge. What, what one begins to miss. Yeah. And one wonders if, you know, young people, and I mean even children, but I also mean, you know, you guys, you know, growing up, like becoming, like, you know, <laughs> older or whatever <laughs> one day. But if, if you miss those kinds of events where, other than Thanksgiving, where you spend just time with a whole bunch of people, probably that you don't even like anymore. Mm -hmm. but, but what happens to that sense of long-term committed communities that are not just designed for that moment, you know, mm -hmm. for that for that sort of like purpose, that mm -hmm. intention to yeah. get a doctorate or about that intention for this. What happens about long term playing basketball friend yeah. friendships? Well mm -hmm. I, I noticed that um, my name is Steve Yadder and doctor yeah. student too here. Um, with the undergraduates that I teach, they're very much like you described, digital mm -hmm. natives trans trans uh -huh. uh, going between many different worlds. But I think they struggle the most in the world of here and now, when they're in the room with you, uh, yeah. or with their friends, yeah. or with their peers. Uh -huh. How? Uh, I, I have many good that? friends who are um, inventing variations 
who, who are very pro bringing mobile tools and so on in schools, but who have moments where it's like um, without cell phones or now we've closed our computers to get people through these moves that I was saying before that we are never in one world at the same time but to teach people to move between these and to feel the differences when for example in a class all of a sudden the teacher says please close your computers just for half an hour I'm talking and I would like not to have everybody read their email while I talk or you know um, now it's time I think it's important to imagine almost these to stage this situation so that people can move between these different ways of being connected, disconnected, connected virtually, physically, so that they begin to enjoy and then appreciate the differences. I think many young people have an incredible, for, I don't want to say too much because that's my own uh, judgment, they have an incredible resilience to be perpetually connected but out of touch. But I mean physically out of touch. That's very interesting. Um, so I am sure they invent other ways to do it that I didn't quite capture. I think what you were saying earlier about how things are moving so fast, right? So yeah. in a lot of ways, how we are physically and how we interact with each other, we're trying, these, we're trying to emulate that in yeah. these spaces. But these spaces and these communities online and stuff afford different ways in which to communicate. And I think at some level, we find a balance. Because yeah. I am someone who, engages race with multiple different communities online a lot. Yeah. And it's kind of what I'm thinking of researching. I'm not thinking about it. I am researching it, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm Sarah and I'm yeah. Ricky's doctor, doctor student. Um, what was interesting to me, I mean, that was like, I yeah. just wanted to add that for this. I think we're yeah. we find a balance eventually. Yeah. I think both are important. And I know that personally, when I go meet my family, I do have arguments with them and they're just like, can you put that down? You know, can you just hang out with yeah. us? You know, I get it. Yeah. There's a different yeah. quality to that interaction. Um, what was interesting to me about what you said earlier was about um, you used the term quality information brokers. Yeah. And it was a, it came out a little earlier, and I think um, a lot of what people think about now. And this this is also to your point about new digital literacies, which is the role of curator, right? That's yeah. become a new kind of exactly. way to look at things. Where you very have, nice. Yeah. You have so yeah. many information yes. things and how to learn how to curate this yeah. information and either and what to do with it beyond that, right? So yeah. you have people who do just the curation, put it out there for us yeah. to consume. But we trust in their skill and ability to yeah. create a certain kind of information, yeah. a certain quality of stuff, which would be useful to us. Yeah. So there's an interesting way in which that, that information broker thing is turning into a skill. Yeah. But how we teach that skill and what to do with it beyond, I think it's still important to have the deep thought about it. But looking at a collection of things and then taking that time to kind of reflect on it would be useful too. So kind of combining what you were saying about, you know, we don't spend time thinking about things. Yeah. And kind of letting it, you know, reflecting yeah. on it, letting it kind of grow inside us before we kind of talk about it. Yeah. And I'm completely, like, I do that. Like, I'm guilty of doing that a lot. But there are times when I have the time to sit and think. Yeah. And my thought process, I notice that it's different, right? Yeah. What I talk, when I talk about it later, it is different. Yeah, yeah. I really do like this. I, I never thought about it quite this way. You know, we used to say that the teacher is no longer the sage on the stage like I do, mm -hmm. but the uh, guide on the side. But maybe the notion of curator, even for educators, uh, is, is an interesting one because, yeah, or choreographer, or uh, to imagine these scenarios. Um, teachers has, have always done that, but they, they take on a different they have to be reinvented slightly, you know. Um, I learned with Bill Porter, an architect, I was giving a class on introduction to design inquiry. I learned that the students don't like to argue verbally, so we, we invented ways, especially it was a class about design, where we would think so hard about what task to give, but then they would actually do show and tells, and as soon as they had everybody's project online, they would just go and talk about it because they were more in the role of almost like a, a jury in an art school. And, and they helped each other in incredible ways and starting always from what the person had produced. It's different rituals of, um, 
And we, I, I, yeah, I don't quite know, but with, with the technology, I think it's the same. It's, you know, Sherry Turkle, I remember when I was young, I was married with a Brazilian, and we used to go to the cafe in, uh, in uh, Geneva. He, he was not looking the whole time at his, he had a newspaper between him and me, and would look at the girls that come into the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if it was much better. <laughs> because I couldn't even see him. I just saw the sports. <laughs> you know, at least it didn't beep at you all the time. Yeah. You know? <laughs> or didn't, the phone didn't ring, and the person on the phone is always more important than the person you're with. You know, so that's yeah, there is trade-offs. So oh, I'd really like you to talk about the work that you're doing at the yeah. So if there's someone else who has some... Yeah, it would be nice to, uh, no, no longer just questions, but to, to get a feel for what you are doing. And maybe what are the hardest questions that come up? Could um, be your video project that you want to do with the poets? That, or the digital storytelling. The digital storytelling. Tell me about it. So I've been working in digital storytelling um, from a sort of from a, a personal perspective yeah. uh, to help people develop uh, or think about their identities mm -hmm. and develop a bit of agency yeah. right at the very beginning. So that process, and I, I sort of think of this in terms for today's world in terms of time and information, and that seems to be what's out of balance. So that the digital storytelling in many ways actually slows everyone down, or the, the process slows everyone down to reflect upon their lives. And um, sometimes it's just a focus on an experience, but it's an experience that sort of changed their viewpoint or changed the way in which they think about themselves. And it's mm -hmm. to, to gather um, their artifacts, their personal artifacts and create a story that's very, very um, abbreviated. It's to, you know, to squeeze out the essence of, of their life or, or that life's experience. And, but it does require time. It's hours and hours of yeah. time. And, and you know, it's, it seemed, in, in what I've, in the stories that have been produced, they're very, it's very worthwhile. Well. But how many of us have that time mm -hmm. to do that? So, you know, the question yeah. is creating learning environments yeah. where, as you said, you allow yeah. time. Slowness. Mm -hmm. It's like slow cook. Yeah. It's slow cook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the other idea I had is that Edith could stay here for a few minutes and some of you that have to go because it is close to four could get on with what you need to do if you're committed. And if anybody wants to talk one-to-one, -one, that's also nice and we'll have to say something to the whole group. That would be lovely, too. So why don't we do that, and then Edith and Chris will go off and have their talk. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.